Carolina and majored in chemistry as an undergraduate at the University of North Carolina. He enrolled in the medical scientist training program at Washington University in St. Louis, where he investigated the neurotoxic mechanisms underlying prion pathogenesis. After graduation from medical school, he completed anatomic pathology, neuropathology, and medical microbiology training at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has been a faculty member of Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School since 2018, with clinical responsibilities on the neuropathology service and the clinical microbiology laboratory. He also runs an infectious disease pathology consult service and serves as the associate director of the Franz von Lichtenberg Fellowship in Infectious Disease and Molecular Microbiology. His primary research interests are improving diagnosis and understanding pathogenesis of viral infections of the central nervous system. I will now turn it over to Dr. Solomon. All right. uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and the invitation to speak uh, in this uh, teaching uh, rounds. <clears throat> so again, the, uh, the title of the talk is Infectious Diseases of the Central Nervous System. Uh, and I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. Uh, in the event that I mention a specific uh, commercial test, it is uh, not an endorsement uh, for that specific test. It's just uh, what we may have happened to use in a specific case. Uh, these are the learning objectives. Uh, I wanted to focus this talk on um, molecular diagnostics and their uh, uses in infectious disease diagnostics. Uh, so the first a learning objective is to identify appropriate molecular testing assays for a pathogen or pathogens of interest, uh, and how to interpret the molecular testing results in the context of the histological and clinical findings. And then finally, to discuss the benefits and limitations of unbiased sequencing assays. So the diagnosis of CNS infections uh, starts way before uh, any specimens make their way to a neuropathologist. A uh, patient will be evaluated by multiple clinical teams, and there's uh, very relevant uh, clinical history, exposures, travel, um, and so forth that can impact uh, the type of testing that's done um, that gives clues to the ultimate diagnosis. Uh, radiology is incredibly helpful, um, whether there's uh, circumscribed re uh, lesions that enhance, uh, whether they're more diffuse lesions. And there's a number of testing um, options, including blood and CSF that are far less invasive than brain tissue, uh, which is typically uh, a diagnostic test of last resort, and ideally to, to rule out other uh, treatable things as well. Uh, so for those of you who saw Dr. Chimeli's uh, lecture a few months ago, she gave a great um, lecture on uh, gross and histologic diagnosis of infection. So I'm not going to uh, repeat a whole lot of what she said before um, and again, focus on uh, the molecular aspects and go through a few uh, case examples. Um, but as with uh, non-infectious um, cases, uh, you want to start with gross examination of whether it's an autopsy and you have a whole brain, or if you just have small uh, biopsies uh, from a surgery. Um, you can get useful information from the interoperative frozen section smear. Sometimes you can see uh, small organisms if you're looking for fungus. Sometimes uh, you'll see viral cytopathic effects, even on the, um, the smears and the frozen sections. Uh, routine h &E, uh, is a workhorse of infectious disease pathology as well as special stains you'd use in other tissues, including gram, uh, silver stains, and so on. Uh, immunohistochemistry is extremely useful for um, a, lot of a lot of the common viruses, and there's uh, well-optimized uh, well commercial antibodies for, uh, for a lot of different viruses, as well as a few other uh, non-viral infections. In situ hybridization uh, is uh, a, a technique that goes maybe in and out of style, but is becoming more useful um, as it's becoming easier to target different uh, sequences. Uh, electron microscopy isn't routinely used for diagnosis, uh, but can be incredibly useful for emerging in infections uh, and confirming um, that certain uh, disease entities are in fact um, associated with viral particles. And then again, we're gonna focus a lot on this talk in molecular testing. Uh, so what are the advantages of molecular testing for infectious diseases? Uh, well, they generate rapid, clinically actionable information uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, 
However, compared to conventional microbiology, where a culture plate costs a couple of dollars, or anatomic pathology, uh, laboratory testing where an h and &E slide uh, is about a dollar uh, worth of materials, uh, molecular testing can be very expensive. And so we want to select the appropriate samples as well as the appropriate molecular assays um, in order to optimally um, utilize resources and uh, come out with the best outcomes for patient care. Uh, so there's a few different types of specimens that can be uh, submitted for molecular testing. Um, the first is a culture isolate, if you have a bacterial culture or a fungal culture, uh, and you can get a pure collection of the organism that has the highest rate of positive testing because you have 100% of uh, the target of interest. However, especially in the case of fungus, it could take days to weeks for growth. Uh, and if you're trying to treat a patient uh, who's in critical condition, sometimes um, there, there is insufficient time to wait for the culture to grow. Alternatively, you can take whatever fresh or frozen tissue or fluids that you have and immediately uh, send those for uh, molecular testing. Um, no, and you don't get any uh, downside of fixation artifacts. Uh, these can be uh, prone to contamination. Uh, you have to be very careful that these are collected sterilely and uh, not opened outside of a BSL uh, or biosafety cabinet. Um, and then lastly, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, uh, which has the advantage of uh, being able to be screened for organisms or inflammatory patterns uh, indicative of an infection. Um, however, the, the flip side is there's a decreased sensitivity due to nucleic acid cross-linking. Uh, there's a number of different types of molecular assays that can be used. Um, you can use a single pathogen assay, such as targeting uh, toxoplasma. These are generally very, uh, have high sensitivity and you can automate them so that they can be read out and reported by a lab technician that doesn't require pathologist interpretation. Uh, but you do have to have high degree of suspicion to select the correct test. And this is just an example of an RT-PCR test. And probably before COVID, people didn't know as much about cycle thresholds and CT values. Um, but this is an example of uh, what we would call a positive test after uh, it uh, has a certain amount of fluorescence and uh, a certain number of RT-PCR cycles. Uh, if you're less sure about a specific pathogen, but you are sure that, um, but you're suspicious that a tissue you've collected um, is representative of an infection, you can use a targeted panel, um, such as for meningitis and cephalitis, uh, you can use CSF or maybe brain tissue. Uh, and these are useful tests because they can serve specimen volume by testing for the most common pathogens uh, associated with specific symptoms. However, these do have lower sensitivity and specificity and will miss unusual organisms. And then lastly, um, there's broad spectrum tests such as bacterial 16S or RNA gene sequencing. Uh, and these can provide genus and uh, often species identification for bacteria or fungus. Unfortunately, there aren't universal primers um, that we can use for viral sequencing. Um, however, these often require interpretation by a pathologist um, or molecular biologist and are limited uh, by the available sequencing databases. So um, similar to uh, cancer sequencing and variants of unclear significance, there's uh, a lot of questions as to what um, bacteria are pathogenic and what, what aren't. Um, and so it's important to have a database that's clinically curated uh, where all of the isolates are related to patient disease. Uh, and then lastly, unbiased sequencing such as metagenomic next generation sequencing uh, is very powerful and has the ability to detect any non-human nucleic acids, including novel pathogens. Um, the high sensitivity can result in false positives because it will detect everything that's in the tube, whether or not it's from the patient. Uh, and it is more expensive uh, because of the bioinformatics aspects. All right, so we'll jump into some cases. Uh, the first case is a 32 year old woman with AML uh, and neutropenia. And she presented with fever, headache, photophobia, blurred vision and right lower extremity pain. And on imaging uh, was found to have a 2.8 centimeter ring enhancing lesion with moderate vasogenic, vasogenic edema, uh, which you can see in this MRI uh, on the right. Uh, at low power, uh, the surgical biopsy showed um, 
this dead eosinophilic uh, area on the left and some hypercellular inflammatory tissue on the right. And at higher power, we can appreciate uh, a lot of neutrophils, a lot of red blood cells. Uh, and then in this uh, eosinophilic, eosinophilic area over here, we can see maybe some wisps of potential um, bacteria. So then on PAS stain, uh, we can highlight these uh, thin rod-shaped organisms uh, that are in clusters, no, no clear branching patterns, uh, but we can tell by the width of these organisms and how they're smaller than neutrophils that they're unlikely to be fungal organisms based on this morphology. Uh, with the methanamine silver stain, it again highlights uh, the thin um, bacillary nature of these organisms. And on a gram stain, we can see that these are gram positive rods. Uh, so this case was signed out as necroinflammatory debris or abscess contents with gram positive bacilli. The organisms were also highlighted by GMS and PASD stains. And importantly, uh, the nocardia or the modified AFB stain was negative uh, to rule out um, nocardia. And so the cultures for this case were negative. However, we were able to send this block for 16S sequencing, uh, and this organism was identified as Bacillus cirrus uh, species. And the tissue itself was immunostained using a Bacillus species antibody, and it was positive. So taking all this together, we integrated uh, the histologic findings of gram-positive rods, molecularly identified an organism that's a gram-positive Bacillus, and also confirmed um, that that molecular finding was in the tissue by another method. Uh, so what is 16S sequencing? Uh, for those of you who are less familiar, uh, all bacteria include the sm small ribosomal subunit, uh, which is primarily encoded by the 16S rRNA gene. Uh, so this is a DNA target, um, but that's translated into, R, uh, into RNA and folded into the ribosome. Uh, it is 1500 base pairs long, more or less, uh, and it contains alternating conserved and variable uh, regions. Uh, so V1 and V2 at the five prime end uh, are short sequences um, that can be targeted and are sufficient to identify uh, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and over a hundred other um, pathogenic species of bacteria. Uh, so if you have a bacterial isolate, it's, it's very easy to get full length uh, reads of this whole gene. Uh, but for paraffin tissue, we tend to focus on smaller regions um, due to the, the length of reads that we can reliably get. And this can be done either by Sanger sequencing or by next generation sequencing. Um, and again, can be done on cultures, uh, culture isolates, fresh frozen tissue, or paraffin embedded tissue. So how do you decide whether a case is worth sending for 16S sequencing? Uh, we don't have great data for um, for brain abscesses, but we did uh, take a look at some endocarditis cases and tried to figure out whether uh, cases that had gram-positive organisms or just silver-positive organisms or no organisms but had the correct inflammatory pattern, um, if any of those findings would have um, positive molecular testing results. So in this first group, we had 43 cases that were gram-positive and also showed organisms so on some other stands. Uh, our second group only showed uh, were gram negative, um, but stain positive by silver stain, which could be indicative of um, the fact that they're not gram positive organisms or that they had antibiotic treatment effect. And then the last group uh, was just uh, acute inflammation, so meeting the histologic criteria, criteria for active endocarditis, and then a control group that had no inflammation at all. And unsurprisingly, we found that. Uh, the cases that had organisms that were on multiple stains were the most likely to be positive, and um, that the fewer stains you had uh, that were positive, the less likely. And if you didn't see any organisms, at least in this small series, uh, we didn't see any positivity. Uh, and then there were some mitigating factors like decalcification and antibiotic treatment that are less relevant for brain abscess. So a question we get a lot is what is the minimal number of organisms needed 
Uh, well, again, in this series, uh, if we didn't see any, um, we had zero positive cases. Uh, if there were rare organisms where you can see one or two here and there, um, we had actually a, a reasonable uh, success rate was 66% or two out of three. Uh, and the one case that was negative was decalcified. Um, however, this, uh, when we diluted it, uh, failed at a fairly low dilution. Uh, whereas when we had more organisms, we saw a positive result in over half the cases. We were able to dilute this out uh, to a much uh, greater dilution. So again, this was just for, uh, mainly for gram-positive cocci, um, which are the most more common organisms for endocarditis. And when you start to think about gram-negatives, uh, anaerobes, uh, and things that, like mycoplasma, that don't stain at all, uh, they don't stain very well, um, this probably um, isn't as strict, but it does show a good correlation of the more organisms, the better uh, results you'll get. And then the last thing that I wanted to say about 16S sequencing is that you have to be careful for contamination um, in the OR and every step of the way uh, in histology and, uh, and in the molecular testing itself. So we, we had a very high rate, almost 42% of samples um, that we see environmental contamination, including most of our negative controls. Uh, compared to our positive cases, it's, these are very faint bands. Uh, but when you cut them out and you purify these bands and you sequence them, you do find uh, bacteria. And what we found was that our paraffin that we used to embed uh, contained uh, bacterial DNA, at least, if not uh, unlikely to be living bacteria. Um, but going through all the different steps from the embedding stations to an unopened bag and to the hot um, melted uh, paraffin, we were able to identify and isolate bacterial DNA. Uh, these are our positive controls. So you can see that these are at the same size. Uh, however, we didn't see it in the water. So we knew that at least um, the introduction of the bacteria was from an identifiable source, which just goes to highlight the need to look at the organisms and decide whether or not there are plausible uh, pathogens for any specific situation. Uh, so to summarize 16S sequencing, it's very useful for detecting bacteria directly from primary samples, including common surgical pathology specimens, such as brain abscess and endocarditis. The diagnostic yield markedly increased by the presence of organisms on histological review. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but if you do have frozen tissue that was saved, uh, ideally sterile in the microbiology lab, uh, you can use this information you've gotten from your uh, histology to inform uh, the likelihood of success on the frozen tissue. And the optimal timing we've found is usually after about five days when the routine aerobic cultures are finalized. Because uh, if you submit tissue for sequencing before then, you run the risk of getting a culture result before you get your sequencing results. All right, so the next case is a 36 year old woman with no significant past medical history. Uh, she presented with five weeks of headaches that were unresponsive to tryptans. Uh, she was born in the Philippines, but then grew up in the United States, but then went back to the Philippines to attend medical school in her 20s. Uh, and then on MRI was found to have a right frontal dural based mass uh, along the right frontal convexity with associated edema. And we don't have any imaging for this case, unfortunately. Uh, but you can see on histology on low power that there is abundant uh, chronic inflammation and a few scattered multinucleated giant cells. Uh, surrounding a rim of uh, eosinophilic and uh, slightly necrotic tissue. Uh, again, at slightly higher power, you can see these multinucleated giant cells. Uh, again, a few more giant cells. And on uh, acid fast staining, we can see a single uh, acid fast bacillus, uh, which is not uncommon um, for mycobacteria. Uh, infections with most species, it's especially mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, they are very rare and you end up having to spend a lot of time scanning, uh, reviewing the slides to find uh, a very low number of organisms. Uh, so this case was signed out as necrotizing granulomas containing, uh, this should be AFB, not AFP, uh, positive organisms involving dura matter consistent with tuberculosis, pacumen, meningitis. 
uh, acid fast bacilli were identified by a Zeal Nielsen AFB stain, and then Gram PSD and MSS stains were negative. Uh, and then this eventually was positive in culture uh, as mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. Uh, so there's a few options for mycobacterium molecular testing. Um, th this is one set of genes that you can target. Um, similar to uh, other bacteria, you can target the 16S rRNA gene. Uh, it's single copy, but highly conserved, uh, and it can distinguish most mycobacterium species. Uh, but if you look at a slide and you only see one or two organisms, this is going to be uh, a difficult uh, test to expect to be positive. And it's usually expected that you need about 50 copies of this gene or 50 organisms um, in the reaction for this to work. Uh, HSP65 is another shorter sequence. Uh, it's only 134 base pairs. It's less susceptible to interference from formal and fixation. Uh, it's less conserved and it's useful, uh, particularly for um, uh, distinguishing non-tuberculous mycobacteria as well as uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, there's another target, IS6110, which is a multi-copy uh, gene that's about 70 base pairs uh, that's almost exclusively present in MTB. Uh, so this allows about tenfold increase in sensitivity when looking for MTB versus uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Uh, and then for any assay you want to include um, that has human tissue, you want to include it a positive control so that you know your PCR reaction is working uh, even in the absence of mycobacteria. Uh, there's other targets you can use as well, such as RPO uh, B or the, the ribosomal polymerase, um, which also is one of the genes um, that contains resistance mutations, so that can be useful to target as well. Uh, so what's the best stain to use? Um, we've looked at using the classic Zeal Nielsen AFB stain. Uh, compared to the fight Farako um, method, uh, which is particularly useful for leprosy um, and uh, sometimes used for nocardia, uh, as well as uh, immunohistochemistry for mycobacteria, um, tuberculosis, which is nonspecific um, and contain, can stain other mycobacteria. And you can see the different magnifications uh, that they all work. Um, however, um, in our hands, at least, the, the modified AFB stain uh, seems to be more sensitive than the Zeal Nielsen stain. And the IHC seems to be about the same sensitivity or shows the same number of organisms as the modified AFB stain. But uh, because the antigen bleeds a little bit, it's easier to see at lower power. So uh, we tend to find this to be a more efficient uh, screening test. And then to put some numbers behind that, um, Again, we found that the Zeal Nielsen the AFB uh, had the highest sensitivity, interestingly, uh, but the lowest sensitivity, so only 20%, uh, whereas the IHC and the modified AFB had similar sensitivity uh, and similar specificity, so they are interchangeable. And so our mycobacteria molecular testing algorithm uh, is to first uh, look at the slides and see if there's organisms on the slides, uh, either by uh, histochemical stands or immunohistochemistry, um, and whether there is clinical suspicion for tuberculosis, and whether there's histologic findings, um, such as necrotizing granulomas or uh, just acute inflammation if it's earlier in the infection. And uh, if all of those are no, then we don't do PCR. If some of those are no, but the cultures are negative at one week, then we'll do um, the, the PCR. We try not to do it less than a week in case there's a rapid grower um, because we were able to identify those fairly readily by um, using multi. And to summarize mycobacterial testing, um, a multi-target sequencing approach can identify MTB and uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria at low concentrations. Uh, the identification of unusual organisms should raise the concern for environmental contamination. Uh, if you find an organism that's only been isolated from sludge, um, then it's probably not um, in the patient. Although uh, with immunosuppression, you can never entirely rule something out, but you want to uh, be very careful. Um, the presence of bacilli on mycobacteria IHC or histochemical stains correlates with a higher yield of sequencing. And again, optimal timing is about one week. So moving on to our third case, uh, we have a 74-year-old man with uh, CLL 
um, an AFib who presented with impaired speech, nausea, vomiting, and uh, what were thought to be seizures. Um, on MRI, he had a large up to 2.9 centimeter, centimeter lesion in the left frontal white matter uh, with uh, central restricted diffusion and some surrounding vasogenic edema. Uh, he, at the same time, he was found to have lung nodules. Um, he had a recent history of pneumonia and this uh, was um, hypothesized to be post-infectious. So now we're going to switch to our virtual slide. I hope uh, everyone has had a chance to look at. And so uh, on the surgical biopsy of this, um, we got many, many little fragments of brain tissue. Uh, there's a lot of blood that's intermixed with very reactive and inflamed um, brain tissue. And not quite in focus, but I'll move around a little bit more. There it goes. Uh, so we can see lots of neutrophils. Again, lots of uh, red blood cells intermixed. Uh, some reactive looking blood vessels. And so we're looking around for um, you know, obvious collections of bacteria fungal elements, uh, parasites, um, things that would be in a differential for large amounts of acute inflammation. We don't appreciate any uh, multinucleated giant cells. So uh, at least a well-developed mycobacterial infection is less likely, uh, although we can't entirely rule out um, an early infection. perivascular inflammation, some corporate amylacea, and then I'm going to uh, sneak over to an area where I know has the diagnostic features. So intermixed, I'm finding the right place. Uh, there should be a few scattered fungal elements. So if you were able to get to, you know, it's very subtle here, but there's a probably a hyphae there and there's some better areas to look around. Got some canidia here, hyphae here. And then once you start to see it, um, they start to pop out all over the place. So we'll switch back to the presentation. Uh, so at low power, again, lots of acute inflammation um, and then a lot of blood that could be just from the procedure. Uh, and then at higher power, we can appreciate some crisp uh, hyphae uh, with septations um, involving blood vessels coming out of the blood vessels. And then on PAS uh, staining with diastase, uh, we highlight these irregular um, but, but thin uh, hyphae. And on the silver stain, um, we can see again, these thin but wavy hyphae with uh, a mix of uh, 90 degree angle branching, maybe something that could look acute angle 
but isn't clearly in the, the camp of Aspergillus or Mucorellus. So this is something that's sort of in between um, his, uh, morphologically. And then we see some rounded structures that we don't want to confuse with, uh, with yeast, um, but that are helpful for this diagnosis. Uh, so on histology alone, we were only able to send this out as a fungal abscess. And we said that the, the silver and the PASD highlighted abundant fungal forms uh, involving blood vessels and brain parenchyma. So this is thought to have um, traveled from the lungs to the brain through the bloodstream. Uh, and then we saw narrow hyphae with abundant septations, irregular branching, and then numerous uh, canidia. And uh, we thought based on that morphology that this was compatible with Scytosporium or Lamentospora, uh, but we also had Fusarium, uh, Canada, and then less likely Aspergillus on our differential. The culture uh, that was sent at the same time of the surgery was positive for mold, uh, and then it was sent to a reference center for susceptibility testing and was uh, sequenced as Scytosporium boidei, uh, which is a member of the Scytosporium apiospermum complex. Uh, so other laboratory testing that's uh, helpful in diagnosing fungal infections includes uh, serologic testing or testing you can do on blood or CSF in some cases. And this can either be uh, testing to look for specific antigens uh, that the fungal organisms uh, make or contain in their cell walls or antibodies such as IgG or IgM showing that the body has uh, ex been exposed to these infections in the past and have mounted an immune response. Uh, generally you need an IgM to indicate it's a recent infection, or you need to have IgG at two different time points to show an increase in, Ig in um, antibody response. And these are available for common infections, uh, including cryptococcus, histoblasto, and coccidioides. Uh, less, more, more, or less specifically, are fungal wall components such as galactamannan and 1,3-beta D-glucan. And you can see in the schematic here that certain organisms uh, such as Aspergillus will include galactomannan, uh, whereas most other uh, species do not, but that's not universal. Uh, and then 1,3-beta-D-glucan is a very common cell wall component, uh, except it's not present in uh, Mucorallis. So if we look at our um, decision-making tree for how to identify fungus uh, in tissue, um, the, the most helpful thing is to look at the size uh, or the, the size, uh, the pigmentation, and the um, branching patterns of the of the of the of the sorry of the filamentous forms of the hyphae. So starting here on the left, if you see a broad ribbon-like hyphae that's posse septated, you can still have a few septations uh, with uh, a predominance of ninety degree angle branching. You're looking at a mucorallis order species, including mucor, rhizopus, obsidian, um, and so on. And these will be negative for galactomannan and 1,3-beta-D-glucan. And again, these are, can be both um, in the blood and in the CSF. And then if you get uh, uniform septate hyphae, so narrow and straight uh, that branch at acute angles, uh, and you have a positive galactomannan, it's most likely to be aspergillus. If you have a negative galactomannan but a positive 1,3-beta-D-glucan, um, it's most likely to be uh, something else, and it can be a lot of different things, including Scytosporium, Fusarium, uh, and so forth. And most of the time, you, you'll need cultures and molecular testing to make a specific diagnosis. Uh, in the event that the galactomannan is negative, uh, it means that it's probably not present in the, the tissue compartment that you've tested, and it, this is less uh, useful. Uh, so if you have an abscess that spreads from the, the sinuses directly into the brain tissue, it's not as helpful as if it is um, going from the lungs through the bloodstream. Uh, and then next, if you have hyphae and pseudohyphae, as well as gram-positive yeast, you're almost certainly um, diagnosing a Canada species. Uh, and if you have pigmented hyphae, that's Fontanimason positive, you're in the phaohyphomycosis group. Uh, and then if you're trying to diagnose yeast in tissue, it's most helpful to look at the size of the yeast and divide it into small, large, or very large um, forms, and then to look at the budding pattern. Uh, so if it's very small and it's narrow budding, it's histoplasma. If it's non-budding, uh, it can be pneumocystis, it could be endospores of coccidioides. Um, it could potentially be 
uh, antibiotic treated bacteria that have lost their gram staining. Uh, and then larger yeast forms with narrow budding can be cryptococcus, which you can stain uh, the capsule for musicarmin and look for uh, pigment with Montana Basan. Broad-based budding can be, uh, is typically blastomyces, and some of these are also positive uh, for Montana Basan. And then the very large yeast forms include the spherules with endospores of coccidioides and rhinosporidium and other uh, unusual things. Now to do fungal sequencing, um, if you are very suspicious for a specific organism like Cryptococcus, you can just target that. Um, this again has higher sensitivity but requires higher clinical suspicion. Uh, there's a number of different broad spectrum targets you can use that are all part of the, the ribosomal uh, genes. Uh, you can see from this schematic that you can target the small ribosomal subunits or the 18S, which is analogous to the 16S in bacteria. Um, but this is not the, the most common um, target for fungus. Uh, instead, more, more labs are using the ITS or the D1D2. And the ITS is the internal uh, transcribed spacer region. Uh, so it's between the large ribosomal subunit and the, the small and includes uh, some linker regions as well. So that's a good target. And then D1D2 is the five prime end of the large sub, uh, ribosomal subunit or the 28S. Um, and that has also been shown to, to discriminate between a lot of uh, similar species. Uh, and some labs will perform both of these on every isolate uh, if they're not sure what they're targeting. Uh, so to summarize fungal sequencing and diagnostics, um, sequencing is very useful for the identification of slow growing molds or species difficult to identify based on morphology. Identification of unusual organisms should raise the concern for environmental contamination, but may also represent disease uh, in immunocompromised patients, because um, a lot of the time those rules just get thrown out the window. And if you have HIV or if you're immunosuppressed for cancer treatment, uh, a lot of unusual things can happen. Uh, and tissue specimens without observable organisms are usually false positives, uh, not 100% due to, to sampling uh, variability. Uh, but fungus, for the most part, is something that you should be able to see on a slide. So if you're told that you have um, aspergillus on sequencing and you don't see it on the tissue, it's more likely that there's some random spores that got into the tube. And then timing depends on the clinical urgency, but usually we, we try to wait one to two weeks um, to see if the cultures are going to be negative or if uh, there's an organism that can't be easily identified. All right, so case number four uh, is a 65 year old man with a history of uh, follicular lymphoma, onrituximab, and has had occasional tick bites, um, common in New England. Uh, he presented with fever and subsequently developed slurred speech followed by neck stiffness. He had an LP and the CSF showed normal glucose, elevated protein, and a mix of lymphocytes and neutrophils. MRI showed the cerebellum with diffuse swelling, obstructive hydrocephalus, some leptomeningeal enhancement, and then also had some signal abnormality in his midbrain and thalami. And so he ended up going to the OR for a, a decompression um, surgery, and at the same time, the surgeon took a biopsy. Unfortunately, he did not do well and uh, expired a few uh, weeks later after a long course in the ICU. And you can see the unfixed brain from the inferior surface, and you can see the, the, the biopsy site. Uh, and again, on the, the fixed section of the cerebellum, you can see that as well. Uh, histologically in the cerebellum, uh, there's a, a lack of Purkinje neurons, so marked neuronal loss. Uh, we see a few microglial nodules in, in one of the brainstem. We see some in the cerebral cortex, um, and then some in the thalamus as well. Uh, so we were very suspicious for a viral infection, including an arbovirus mediated by ticks, which uh, in New England is almost always Powassan virus. Uh, and so this was immunostained and the few remaining Purkinje neurons and their, their processes were strongly positive for Powassan virus antigen. And so the final diagnosis for this case was Powassan encephalitis. Um, a CSF sample was sent for metagenomic sequencing uh, which identified Powassan virus and the, the lineage to deer tick virus. Um, interestingly, the IgM, both in the blood and the CSF, was negative, which is the typical way to diagnose an arboviral infection. 
um, but the uh, relentless uh, neurology resident was able to convince uh, the, the reference lab to do PCR testing, which isn't routine on these tissues and found uh, that they were positive both in the serum and the CSF. And then um, it was confirmed that the brain tissue itself was also positive and that the immunostaining, which we saw was positive. And this is a deer tick, which is the, uh, the, the vector for this infection. So uh, there's a large number of viruses that can infect uh, the central nervous system. And I'm not gonna go into details of how to diagnose all of those. Um, Roughly, you can split them into groups that are um, diagnosable by morphologic criteria alone, um, and then ones that require ancillary uh, testing. So a lot of the DNA viruses, including the herpes viruses, um, as well as adenovirus and poliomavirus, measles and rabies, all produce very distinctive um, viral inclusions. And if you see those, you can almost, um, you can very reliably uh, diagnose infection. I think. EBV doesn't really produce great uh, inclusions, but there are um, readily available uh, in situ hybridization or, or immunostains for that. Um, and it's often in lymphomas as well that are in the brain. But all of these other tests, uh, all of these other infections um, tend to have overlapping features, predominantly lymphocytic, but sometimes neutrophilic inf uh, inflammation early on. Um, and microglial nodules, leptomeningeal inflammation, uh, but have few specific features. Uh, HIV does have multinucleated um, giant cells uh, that can be helpful, but it is not entirely specific. Um, and then this is just a few uh, images showing the common arboviral diseases um, in the United States. And you can see some of them uh, such as Eastern equine, um, tend to be in the Northeast and the Southeast US. Uh, lacrosse encephalitis uh, is in the Southeast and up in the, the Midwest and, and so forth. So metagenomic next generation sequencing um, in, in, is a very powerful technique. And in the, um, the most basic sense, you take whatever specimen you start with and you purify all the DNA and then you can purify the RNA and first transcribe that into cDNA and you can sequence that and sequence everything that's there and then bioinformatically remove all the human reads and try to interpret the signals you have left. Um, there's other ways you can enhance for certain types of pathogens if you're working with a specific tissue type and you're more interested in RNA viruses, you can focus on those. Um, there's methods to increase the yield of certain pathogens by um, doing targeted in, in, uh, metagenomics, um, using a, a limited number of primers. And then you can also enhance uh, using amplicon-based uh, testing. Uh, but the advantages of, of testing of this sort uh, is that it's a single test, you don't have to try to come up with a list of 10 different things and hope that you have enough sample volume. Uh, it's largely unbiased, although there are certainly ways you can bias it um, to increase sensitivity. Uh, and it has a moderate turnaround time, which is um, in increasing, or the, sorry, the turnaround time is decreasing uh, as all these um, steps are getting faster, including the interpretation and the, the wet lab preparation. Uh, the limitations are that it's relatively expensive. If a routine, a molecular test cost a couple hundred dollars compared to um, a culture, which is a couple dollars. Uh, these tests are often a thousand dollars or more. Um, so we don't, you don't want to um, go straight to metagenomic testing every single time necessarily. And the sensitivity can be somewhat lower uh, depending on the assay and you have to have a sufficient quantity of the pathogen nucleic acid. So again, if it's an arboviral infection um, that's typically diagnosed by serology, due to the, the short um, viremic window, there may not be enough uh, viral nucleic acid in the CSF, or uh, if that's what you're testing uh, to get a positive result, even though in theory, it's the most broad, uh, highest uh, sensitivity test in theory. Uh, so to summarize all that, um, 
unbiased or metagenomic uh, sequencing is powerful. These are powerful tools for identification of pathogens with broad infectious differentials, including viral men meningoencephalitis. Uh, it can identify novel pathogens, but must distinguish from environmental contamination that every lab um, will run controls and knows the, the common things that they'll see based on their own reagents. Uh, relatively expensive, but could provide cost savings if ordered instead of a large panel of molecular tests. Uh, so some labs are considering uh, doing quick one hour uh, panel testing, and then when that's negative, reflexing to a, a broader um, metagenomic test. Uh, but those optimal um, algorithms haven't been worked out. And then again, the turnaround time is improving. All right. Um, so we'll go through these last two cases uh, somewhat rapidly so we have time for questions at the end. These are pretty straightforward. Uh, so we have a 56-year-old man with, an untre with untreated hepatitis C, alcoholic liver disease, interstitial lung disease, who had progressive cognitive decline over several days without fever or meningitis, and had these multiple large during enhancing lesions up to three centimeters, um, which you can see the frontal lobe, occipital lobe. Uh, low power, you can see inflammation, chronic inflammation on the right and dead tissue on the left. And we can see these uh, unusual non-human looking structures, uh, circumscribed lesions with small uh, little organisms inside. And by toxoplasma immunistic chemistry, we can confirm this is a toxoplasma bradyzoite. Uh, this is a separate case um, just to illustrate what uh, tachyzoites will look like surrounding the tissue. And this is a case of toxoplasma uh, encephalitis versus the, the circumscribed abscess that we see in our original case. Uh, so this is abscess with toxoplasma gondii organisms identified. Uh, the IgG was positive, uh, suggestive of infection, uh, but unable to determine the time based on the IgG status. And at this time, the patient was uh, simultaneously diagnosed with HIV, explaining the, um, the reason for having toxoplasma. Uh, so parasitic infections um, are largely h &E diagnoses. There's some um, ancillary testing you can do with immunostains and serology, um, but for the most part, uh, we don't require molecular uh, testing uh, to make the diagnosis. Uh, and these are, can be further divided into protozoans or single cell organisms, including the amoebas, malaria, toxoplasma, and trypanosomes, and then multinucleated or larger uh, organisms, including the three types of worms, flatworms, uh, sorry, um, roundworms, flatworms, and uh, flukes. And so sometimes you can see eggs and sometimes you actually see the adult or various stages of the worms. So to summarize parasites, uh, morphologic diagnosis is sufficient in many cases. Uh, we're often unable to identify those species but can specify helminth versus protozoan, nematode versus trematode versus cestode, amoeba and to versus toxoplasma and so on. And there are very helpful uh, uh, consultation services available from reference centers uh, if you want to identify something histologically or if you need a molecular diagnosis for a specific reason. Serology and exposure history can certainly narrow the differential. Um, and then there are some targeted assays if you need to distinguish between different types of amoebas, for instance. And metagenomics, particularly for CSF, uh, is also clinically available at this point. And then our very last case is a 56 year old woman with no significant past medical history. And she presented with multiple neurological complaints, including headaches, gait abnormalities, slowed speech, trouble swallowing, difficulty with driving, memory and calculations, and had an insidious decline in functioning and her activity of daily life over two to three months. Her MRI showed uh, cortical restricted diffusion, <clears throat> In the occipital, temporal, frontal, and parietal lobes, which you can see here, excuse me, <coughs> as well as <clears throat> T2 flare <coughs> hyperintensity in the <coughs> basal ganglia and the thalami. <coughs> On low power, 
Uh, you can appreciate this vacuolated pattern throughout the brain and the cortex, <clears throat> which you can see sharp punched out lesions uh, and significant loss of neurons. <clears throat> in the cerebellum, you can see a similar pattern in the molecular layer, punched out, <clears throat> vacuolated uh, areas. So this was diagnosed as prion disease, most likely CJD. Uh, it was sent to the National Prion uh, Reference Center where they performed a Western blot and did immunistic chemistry using the 3F4 antibody to detect uh, aggregates or PRP, of PRP scrapey. Uh, and the, these are representative images, not necessarily from this case, <clears throat> but does show um, <clears throat> aggregates of uh, prion protein and here you can see a representative Western blot where you have the, the normal three bands, uh, the three different glycosylation patterns of the prion protein. And then after uh, proteinous K digestion, you have the retained bands here. And then for cases without prions, you don't see anything after you digest with proteinase K. And then this, uh, these are just different examples of different strains that migrate at different uh, sizes. Um, So uh, the CDC updated their diagnostic guidelines in 2018 to incorporate uh, the inclusion of RT quick, uh, as well as um, <clears throat> MRI, uh, the recent MRI sequences that have become validated. So in the last 10 years, um, the ability to diagnose a prion disease reliably pre-mortem has drastically increased <clears throat> based on MRI. Uh, previously, we could just do 14.3.3 on CSF, which is very nonspecific, and then tau was added, <clears throat> which was also nonspecific, but uh, generally at the levels you see in prions are uh, high enough that you would <clears throat> have it higher in your differential. And then RT quick, which I won't go into detail, or is uh, just a way to amplify prions um, in tissue or prion-like um, aggregates and tissue to confirm a diagnosis. And this is considered extremely highly um, specific. Uh, however, um, if this testing isn't done or isn't known, <clears throat> you can um, reliably diagnose prion disease uh, based on histology with uh, spongiform degeneration. <clears throat> and you can confirm by Western blood in immunistic chemistry and if there is uh, a likelihood of um, a familial um, prion disease, you can sequence the PRNP gene. So the overall summary for this talk is that CNS infections can be effectively diagnosed by gross and histologic findings with appropriate ancillary testing. Targeted assays can be useful when a specific pathogen is suspected on clinical or histologic grounds. And uh, consider panel or unbiased testing if a broad differential exists. And then um, critically, um, molecular testing results should be correlated with the histologic findings for a final integrated diagnosis, just like we uh, do for uh, brain tumors. And now I'm happy to take any questions and I appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you, Dr. Solomon, this was great. You know, I know this is a molecular talk, but some of those pictures are just beautiful. Um, at this time, we're, we're gonna move into Q and A. We just have a couple minutes. You can submit your questions via the chat box or unmute to ask a question. When you submit via the chat box, please ensure the message is to everyone so that the presenters and attendees can all see it. And to unmute, select the microphone in the lower left corner. And once you've asked your question, please remute to avoid background noise. Well, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions, but I have one myself. Um, I understand the cycle threshold for the viruses. I think we all do because of COVID, but is there the same principle for the bacteria of the a cycle threshold um, effects? Um, so cycle threshold is useful for a positive or negative result, and then you can get some quantitative information out of it. Uh, in and of itself, it doesn't tell you, um, like you can't compare cycle thresholds between instruments, but if you have a standard um, 
if you have standards, you can make a dilution and, and come up with uh, an actual um, count. So for bacteria, that's not necessarily as helpful because for the most part, we already know there's a bacterial infection there. Um, it's more for identification. You just wanna make sure that you amplify enough of it to, to get a good sequencing result. Okay, okay, I see. But I'm, there, there's probably some bacteria that, that do get diagnosed by RT-PCR and they would you know, use the same site threshold, but that's if you already know the, what you're looking for. Then I do have a question, although I cannot tell who's asking it. It says, thank you for the great talk. I had several cases of vertebral body question mark TB radiologically, but could not find any organisms on Zeal-Nielsen. Should I request PCR? Uh, if the histologic findings are otherwise suspicious, if there's granulomas, if there's inflammation, um, potentially you could also consider trying to do other uh, stains. We find, again, that the, the modified AFP stains do have a higher sensitivity. Um, the other issue is that if there's a lot of decalcification in these bony specimens, sometimes that decreases the sensitivity of the stains. Uh, again, that also decreases the sensitivity of the molecular testing. So you have to balance um, all those factors. So it, it's definitely worth it if there's high enough clinical suspicion um, and it's needed for treatment purposes. Uh, if the patient's gonna get treated regardless, it, it may not be as helpful to do uh, other than for peace of mind. Okay, okay, I think we can do one more question from Dr. Beatriz Lopez. With regard to the flow chart for ordering PCR from mycobacteria, in your experience, how often is the PCR positive when the testing is initiated based on clinical suspicion without histological suspicion? Um, well, we, if there's no histologic evidence, we don't send it. So it, it's uh, the denominator is, is zero. Okay. So we, anytime we send out uh, a test, uh, Anytime we get a clinical request for molecular sequencing for an infection, um, either I review the slides or our, one of our other pathologists will review the slides to make sure it makes histologic sense. And if it doesn't make sense, then we uh, refuse to send it. Okay. Um, well, I'm unsure if I should keep going with questions. I just, I, on my clock, it's a little past 11 o'clock. Um, we can go okay. ahead and wrap up Dr. Oviedo. I think we've got just a, a minute left. Um, but okay. thank you again, um, Dr. Oviedo and Dr. Solomon, um, and thank you to everyone for joining today's AANP Teaching Rounds presentation. Um, we would ask that you take a few minutes to complete a short evaluation, which was just entered into the chat box. Completion helps to ensure accurate reporting to the accreditation board, and it might not display as a link, so please copy and paste it into your web browser if needed. The PowerPoint presentation slides and recording will be posted to the AANP website in the next week. Um, and thank you again to Dr. Solomon for an excellent presentation. This concludes the session for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.